Muy buenos días a todos. Es un placer realmente tener un, el día de hoy en la conferencia inaugural magistral al doctor profesor Fritz Scholz. El doctor Fritz Scholz nació en 1955 y se graduó de químico en la Universidad Humboldt en Berlín. De, de, en esa universidad, después, más adelante, obtuvo, obtuvo su, su grado de profesor y desde 1998 se movió hacia la Universidad de Griswold en Alemania, donde actualmente es el profesor principal de la Cátedra de Química Analítica y Ambiental. Él ha participado en más de 300 conferencias y ha sido invitado especial en más de 125 ocasiones, hoy una más, y ha sido, eh, más bien fue elegido miembro de la International Society of Electrochemistry en el 2015. En su parte académica científica ha publicado más de 320 artículos científicos, tiene un índice H de mayor a 62 y más de 11.000 citas. Es coautor y editor de una diversidad de libros, entre ellos destacan el libro de métodos electroquímicos, Electroanalytical Methods de Springer, el otro, Electrochemistry of, of Immobilized Particles and Droplets, de Springer también, es coeditor del de Diction, Electrochemical Dictionary y ha participado en los volúmenes 7A, 7B de la Encyclopedia of Electrochemistry editada por Barr, eh, además del Handbook of Reference Electrodes. Además, él fundó dos artículos, do, dos journals, el Solid State Electrochemistry y el Chemtext, que es un, una, una revista de, dedicada fundamentalmente a difundir y, eh, y generar con propósitos educativos material para generar reflexiones entre los profesores y de esa manera generar un ambiente didáctico adecuado y que no está cubierto muchas veces por los libros de texto. Entre muchos de, de sus notables resultados destacan las técnicas que ha desarrollado en su laboratorio para generar la voltametría y análisis electroquímico de partículas inmovilizadas. Eh, además, se ha dedicado al estudio de micropartículas sólidas y de materiales eh, mediante estas técnicas que realmente requieren una manipulación muy cuidadosa. Además, eh, como si esto no fuera poco, todavía le da tiempo de dedicarse a labores de editorial. Y es miembro del Editorial Board de Electrochemistry Communications, Condensed Materials and Interfaces, Russian Journal of Electrochemistry, y es el editor en jefe de Textbook, textbook of Journal of Electrochemistry, Journal of Solid State Electrochemistry, y, mon, y, y participa dentro de los editores principales de Monographs in Electrochemistry. Con nosotros, el doctor Fritz Schultz. Please, Fritz. Thank you very much, Bernardo, for the introduction. I think I understood most of what you said, and it was correctly and very kind of you. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> dear uh, colleagues in Mexico and wherever, uh, today I will talk about the electrochemistry of these immobilized microparticles and microdroplets, as already mentioned by Bernardo and will show you that this is a, a very good technique to get fundamental data. And I think that's the most important, uh, what we can achieve that we produce uh, basic data of materials and as I will show you also of ions. So, um, you know, when you want to study solids, uh, of course, the best way is not to destroy the material, not to dissolve it in uh, some acid or basic solutions and then study the solutions because you will lose a lot of information on the solid material. So one should attempt to uh, study solids as they are in their solid form. And um, there, here's an short overview what methods have been developed in the past. Of course, you know, compact electrodes and they will stay important for corrosion, of course. Then composite electrodes, powders with binders, carbon and so on, paste electrodes and so on. 
Uh, I just want to mention uh, shortly that method il electrography because it is not anymore so well known, but I think it's a good idea and maybe somebody can uh, develop it again. My talk will be about the mobilized microparticles because that is uh, the method which I have introduced about 30 years ago. So my talk is in principle about our work within the last 30 years, but I will concentrate of, uh, on the most recent developments. And um, um, okay, so a word about electrography. That technique has been introduced by a Russian scientist, Alexander Ilyich Glazunov. He is related to the famous composer Glazunov and um, that uh, he was born in St. Petersburg and he died in Chile, in Santiago de Chile. Uh, he has a very interesting life. And if you like uh, to read about it, you can see it or read it in that paper in General Solid State Electrochemistry, which is in press. It is in principle a method to get electrochemically an imprint of the surface of metals or minerals also. So the mineral is pressed on a paper which contains a solution, for example, uh, dimethyl glyoxime. And if you oxidize, of course, nickel to nickel two plus ions, that will form a red, of course, a red imprint. At that time, they couldn't make a color figure. So uh, this technique is really interesting and as uh, I think as a first um, surface analytical imprinting technique published. But as I told you, I will concentrate, of course, on what we have done and speak about the voltammetry of immobilized microparticles. In our first papers, we used the term um, abrasive stripping voltammetry because um, I will show you that the metals which we deposited abrasively on an electrode uh, were stripped uh, by electrochemical measurement. So that was a purely analytical expression, but later uh, we could show that uh, you can do much more with the microparticles. You can convert one microparticle in another compound and so on. It has been introduced um, in, in 1989. It consists of a really very simple mechanically immobilization of particles on the surface of a suitable electrode. That immobilization is done, as you see here, you have a glass plate or a tail and you put the powder on it and then you press uh, and then you can make the electrochemical measurements in a very usual uh, common uh, three electrode cells so that the solution touches the surface of that electrode. Uh, we were, um, and after the measurement, you have to clean it, of course, you can do it on paper and you can use a lot of different electrodes. We um, almost uh, exclusively used paraffin impregnated graphite electrodes. So spectrographic graphite rods were impregnated uh, on a vacuum with uh, melted paraffin and then the electrodes were removed and dried and so on and you can use them. Uh, other people used other electrodes, uh, Bond and others, for example, the pyrolytic graphite electrodes, which are very expensive. I mean, the highly oriented pyrolytic graphite electrodes. Uh, in my opinion, it's not necessary. You can use glassy carbon. It's not very good because you scratch the surface and you can not easily remove uh, the particles. But a very uh, nice technique is to use pencil leads. I think Holzer was the first who used uh, pencil leads. And uh, now, especially the group of Antonio Domenic Carbo in Valencia is using these electrodes and I will introduce him and his work later. When you have particles immobilized on the electrode surface, uh, you form a three phase junction line. And depending on the properties of that particle, 
the electrode reaction may start only at that three phase junction line or it may start on the entire surface when you have an electrically conducting um, uh, particle, of course, um, you apply a potential and uh, the entire surface can react, but that depends really on the properties of the electroactive solid compound. Um, whether uh, <clears throat> it starts at that three phase junction and it depends on the ionic conductivity and electronic conductivity. Uh, where the reaction or how the elect uh, reaction um, proceeds. For example, when you have these battery materials, which uh, have uh, ionic conduction and electronic conductivity, uh, then the reaction will um, form such reaction front and go through the entire particle. And that, that was one of the intriguing questions we had, how is really such reaction proceeding? Where does it start? How does it proceed through the particles and so on? I will give you some uh, examples. First, something about metals and alloys. That allows easy qualitative identification of constituents, but also quantitative analysis and even corrosion data. Uh, the first procedure or the first uh, example of such analysis was the analysis of lead antimony alloys published in 89. That was a PhD student, Lutz Nitschke, and that was my former boss when I uh, was still working in Berlin. And you see here, when you abrasively um, mechanically transfer traces of such alloys, to the surface of the electrode, you can anodically dissolve them. That was the reason that we called it st uh, stripping voltammetry. And uh, you see uh, immediately when you would uh, use a compact piece of these alloys, maybe you would just see a, a shoulder for the oxidation of lead and antimony uh, would be almost not visible because the currents are uh, exceedingly high with compact electrodes. But when you transfer only small amounts to the surface, just by very gentle scratching with the electrode to surface, you can dissolve all the lead and all the antimony. So in one scan, you dissolve all what you have deposited. And of course, you never know how much you have transferred. So it needs a special calibration. And here you see the calibration graphs, percent lead, percent antimony. And uh, we simply made the calibration taking both peak currents or also the integrals, uh, the no, areas uh, underneath the peaks uh, as 100%. And then you get a certain percentage. Uh, in your experiment and you have to uh, use a calibration curve. These curves are never uh, linear. They cannot be linear for reasons uh, which we have published and shown, but the talk is too small to explain you, but it's uh, in principle no problem. We have studied a lot of alloys and uh, we could even detect certain phases in dental amalgams and so on. So for all these uh, alloys, it was uh, shown that uh, this approach is useful. Then of course we thought, okay, let's take minerals or inorganic compounds, not only metals. And um, you get a lot of information about the electrochemical properties, oxidation reduction potentials, reversibility, elemental composition, elemental, composition also in a quantitative way. And I will show you this, um, this example that is a mineral lead antimony sulfide. You can reduce it. And upon reduction, you get these metals on the surface of the electrode surface. And the sulfide ions are of course protonated and uh, go to the solution. And after that reduction step, you can make an oxidation scan. And then you see a clear signal for lead and a clear signal for antimony. The oxidation 
of these minerals uh, usually gives not very um, uh, easily interpretable um, signals, but of course, all these three, these three uh, scans together are an absolutely unambiguous ambiguous, um, feature of a mineral. So you can identify most tiny particles amounts of a mineral going down to 10 to minus 9, 10 to minus 10 uh, gram or 10 to minus 12 mole. And you can easily say after you have recorded these voltammograms what it is. That was a collaboration with somebody, with Dr. Damaschun from the Museum of Natural Science in Berlin. You see him here at the time when we made these experiments. Uh, then you see here such, uh, I called it here, uh, analogous to anodic stripping voltammetry. First reduction, then oxidation. These voltammograms of Tallium tin sulfides of different stoichiometries. You see, for each stoichiometry, you have a very distinct um, fingerprint of uh, these mineral phases. And you can quantitative analyze that um, using chronoculometry. So now we come to a real quantitative aspect. You see here. Uh, the theoretical ratio uh, thallium to tin and what we experimentally have determined. And uh, you, should, um, <clears throat> uh, you should know that, of course, all these data have been taken from most tiny amounts, much, much less than micrograms. I think in the range of maybe 10 to minus 7, 10 to minus 8 grams. Uh, such um, the stoichiometry the determinations are easy when you have large amounts of that substance to solve it and uh, you use whatever you want. But uh, to make such analysis with a single particle of such mineral is something else. And that can be achieved. And you see most of the work uh, has been done by Birgit and by Zhang, a postdoc from Heidelberg at the time. Here you see such chronoculometric uh, curves and how we could also determine quantitatively the stoichiometry of different thallium sulfides. And uh, the way to do it is first to record the oxidation, the reduction charge, and then the oxidation charge. And whatever uh, stoichiometry you have, you will have get different ratios for these charges. Uh, recorded with chronoculometry. And you see here the experimental data, here's the theoretical data. One of the highlights of that technique uh, for solid state investigations are studies of solid solutions of mixed crystals, because uh, solid solutions, of course, uh, follow the thermodynamics of, um, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, of solutions. And uh, when you have, for example, two solid compounds, A and B, each will give you, let us say, a reduction potential here and the other a reduction potential here. Could be also oxidation potentials. But when A and B form a solid solution, uh, of course, uh, following from thermodynamics of mixed phases, you expect one signal and that signal should shift from the position of A to B. Uh, not linearly because of the mixing entropy, but uh, that deviation due to mixing entropy is rather small. In an ideal case, it's only 17.7 millivolt um, at 50-50 uh, composition. Here you see an example that is the reduction signal of copper sulfide here of copper selenide and here of a mixed phase of a solid solution of these two com copper compounds. And when you have a phase mixture, you immediately see ah, you have two signals. So that is a phase mixture, it's not a solid solution. An information which you again can extract from the most tiny amounts from uh, 
little crystals which you prepare maybe with a needle and a microscope or whatever you immobilize and you measure and you can even quantitatively determine the composition when you construct first a calibration curve that is a calibration curve for the solid solutions of copper selenide and copper sulfide and you see of course the mixing and the ideality is here not fulfilled they are not very ideal behaving. Also with reductive dissolution, <clears throat> you can um, uh, see uh, such um, uh, shift of the signals for irreversible systems that are manganese oxide, iron oxide systems studied in Prague by Gruger at that time. Uh, that is not controlled by uh, strict thermodynamics. So you cannot uh, calculate from these peak signals uh, thermodynamic data, but you can analyze them and you can quantitatively after calibration say what you have. And again, a micro method for most um, tiny amounts of <clears throat> solid substance. Now, let me uh, tell you something about the transformation and the piece of mineral phases. These are three minerals. Each of them exists in two modifications. And of course, both modifications will always produce the same uh, final products upon reduction, silver and these um, anions. And then it is again <laughs> very simple that the, when you can conduct these reduction under uh, reversible conditions, then the difference in the potentials uh, must uh, give you access to the delta G of um, uh, transforming one mineral phase to the other. And you can determine then also the entropies. And here you see, for example, for xanthoconite to prostite, um, the delta G, which we have determined in, in a very simple way, much easier than with other methods. Now, let me show you some examples from the polycyanometallates. Polycyanometallates are fantastic compounds because they uh, follow an insertion electrochemistry. So upon oxidation or reduction of the centers of the redox centers, you will introduce or expel ions to the solution. And you can uh, uh, produce, you can uh, synthesize very complex polycyanometallates. You, you know Prussian blue, of course. In Prussian blue, you have low spin iron uh, on the carbon uh, sites and high spin iron on the nitrogen, nitrogen coordinated sites of the cyanide ions. But of course you can uh, substitute uh, the low spin iron by cobalt, the high spin iron uh, by any other metal, for example, copper, and you get uh, solid solutions. You may get solid solutions of the different phases and study the electrochemistry. And for us, it was interesting to see uh, on what parameters depend these oxidation reduction potentials. And it was Alle Stostal uh, who studied a huge uh, or large number of metal hexacyanophorates, that silver hexacyanophorate, lead hexacyanophorate, copper hexacyanophorate, and so on. And he looked for a correlation with the parameters of these metals. And uh, we have seen that there is a correlation with um, the charge uh, of, of the metal ions divided by the ray, uh, no, sorry, uh, just uh, one divided by the radius uh, with the radius of these metal ions. And uh, <clears throat> Then we thought, okay, it seems to depend on, um, on that parameter, lattice parameter. And we looked for the reduction, oxidation, reduction potential of the hexacyanophorate ions dissolved in water. And in water, of course, the ions have as nearest neighbor, let us say on the nitrogen coordinated sites, they have water, so they have the proton. The proton has uh, 
in, in crystals a theoretical negative ratio, uh, radius. And uh, we made that plot and we have seen that the line exactly crosses the point for hydrogen. And please believe me, that is not the line including that point, but this line is, has been calculated only from that points of the solid because it would be idiotic, mathematically idiotic to uh, make a uh, uh, regression line here with one point very much outside. But uh, since we had that line and we have seen, aha, uh -huh, that um, is, is a radius of uh, the reciprocal radius of uh, the proton, it tells us that something seems to be behind and it connects solid state electrochemistry with solution data. And now comes the story that I had a very good uh, PhD students from you from Mexico. You all, I think, know him, Maximiliano Barcina Soto. And he came to me and wanted to make a PhD at Humboldt University. And uh, he was very uh, theoretically gifted and mathematically gifted. And he uh, worked on uh, born harbor cycles for these electrochemical systems. And he derived an equation which clearly shows that the formal potential must shift with the a constant divided by the radius of the metal ions. So it's exactly what we see here. And then he continued and studied also the depends uh, of the redox potential uh, uh, um, depending on the intercalating metal ions, let us say cesium, rubidium, potassium, and so on. And again, by born harbor cycles, he has shown that uh, this is a constant divided by the radius of the ion. So the ion potential, many people call it the ion potential, one divided by the radius of an ion. And you see exactly the data follow these lines. And then we took also uh, into account the metal ions, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, which are nitrogen coordinated. So we looked at manganese hexacyanoferrate, manganese hexacyanomanganate, and manganese hexacyanochromate. And the same series for iron and for chromium. So here manganese is always nitrogen coordinated, here always iron, and here always chromium. And what was the result? The result was again, uh, that this depends on the radii of these uh, nitrogen coordinated ions, uh, the distance between uh, the two metal ions. And uh, he could derive that also theoretically. Now let me speak about the thermodynamics of electro insertion electrochemical electrodes. That is really a team play. It's a team play between the exchange of ions and the exchange of electrons. And uh, I uh, cannot uh, now follow the history of uh, uh, my approach, but I will tell you the following. I always dreamed about a possibility to determine for both electrodes, that is an electrochemical sense is an electrode, an exchange of ions, and that is an exchange of electrons. I wanted to separate the free energy of ion exchange here and the free energy of electron exchange. And uh, we were successfully in doing that with immobilized droplets. I will tell you a little bit later. So that uh, story with the droplets was much easier, but I wanted to do that also uh, with the solids, with uh, solid phases insertion electrochemistry. And in that uh, mini review here in Angewandte Chemie, uh, you can, of course, in the international edition in English, you can read the story. So we have three phases, electron conductor, let us say graphite, the solid phase and the solution. Here, the ions are exchanged here electrons. That must be connected with the delta G of ion transfer and that with the delta G of electron transfer. 
And if you really want to understand battery materials, for example, and if you want to develop better battery materials, you should know what are the two um, uh, delta G values for these two electrodes, which are of course a team play and connected. And <clears throat> the uh, solution was that we uh, combined voltammetric measurements and potentiometric measurements. In potentiometry, the ions are only bond to the surface of uh, the solid material and exchanged with the surface. Think of the glass electrode, for example, or any other ion sensitive electrodes. But when you perform voltammetry, you really convert a certain layer of the phase. You have here that electron transfer and ion transfer. So if you are able to perform voltammetric measurements and potentiometric measurements reversibly, then you can separate these two separ uh, uh, contribution because here you have only delta G ion transfer, here you have both delta Gs. So, and it was uh, really a very uh, lucky uh, case that we found that a very certain tungsten bronze, a tungsten bronze is uh, able to provide uh, potentiometric measurements reversibly and cyclic voltammetry. Of course, it is a pH sensor also. And it was Regina Cisternas from Chile who did these experiments and uh, who uh, could show for the first time that from the difference of the mid-peak potentials in voltammetry and the open circuit potentials in potentiometry, we get a value for the standard potential of electron transfer. And that idea was picked up by my very good friend, Antonio Domenic Carbo from Valencia, who had uh, luckily very special gold complexes. And these gold complexes, he immediately tried whether he can do similar experiments with these uh, compounds and really potentiometry worked reversibly and cyclic voltammetry. And when you study the depends on the logarithm of the anion concentration, you get two absolutely parallel lines and from the difference you can calculate these values. Here you see for two complexes, L1 is one complex solid complex, L2 is another solid complex. And he studied that with chloride, perchlorate, nitrate and hexafluorophosphate anions. Uh, there's that intercalation electrochemistry. And here are the values for delta G ion transfer. And you see when you use different anions, of course, the delta G for the ion transfer changes in an uh, understandable way. But the delta G for electron transfer is almost constant. I uh, would say these uh, values are a little bit scattered, but also here for the other compound, even better fulfilled, you see uh, practically constant delta G electron transfer values, but different values for the ion transfer. So we have really here achieved the separation of these two contributions. And uh, okay, I will um, not speak about this, but what you now also can do is that you study the transfer of ions from a solvent A and from a solvent B. And when these two solvents are miscible, can be mixed, uh, then you can study the transfer, the delta G transfer of ions from solvent A to solvent B, just making that um, electrochemistry. Here, we didn't separate the uh, delta G values for ion transfer and electron transfer because electron transfer is in both cases the same, but of course the ion transfer uh, is different. And uh, so you get easily values for the transfer of ions between miscible solvents. Uh, we did that also for uh, example, uh, water, normal water, H2O and T2O, heavy water. 
And uh, this way we could uh, study the delta G values for uh, the transfer from normal water to heavy water, what you of course cannot do because they are both uh, miscible with each other. Then let me tell you something about hyphenated in situ techniques. Uh, X-ray can be combined with our uh, uh, immobilized microparticles, light microscopy, in situ calorimetry, in situ atomic force microscopy. That was an example for X-ray studies. Again, uh, Birgit has studied that. We could show that for PBO, there is a simultaneous uh, conversion of PBO to PB, but how does it proceed? I mean, we, we could not, of course, uh, uh, see in that X-ray studies. In case of other compounds, of course, uh, you cannot see such um, uh, smooth transfer from one solid to the other, but there is in between obviously something amorphous and then recrystallizes lead. That was the beginning and then uh, also uh, light microscopy was studied and developed for, by Uwe Schroeder. Uh, uh, he made the PhD with me and later he got a call to Braunschweig, was professor in Braunschweig for 13 years, I think. And now he is back to Greifswald, he's my follower. So I'm of course very happy that he uh, came back uh, to our university here. You see his combination of uh, microscopy and electrochemistry. So conversion of a bright yellow to a red brown compound falls and back. And, uh, he uh, used the uh, uh, spectroscopy, the diffuse reflection spectroscopy, and calculated the Kubelka uh, Munch function. And from this data, you can unambiguously say how the reaction proceeds. Where does it start? Does it start at the interface uh, with a graphite electrode or with a solution? And so, so a lot of mechanistic insight with the technique. And then again, uh, Maximiliano, uh, Max uh, uh, developed uh, thermistor electrodes. You see here very, very tiny graphite, that diameter here, one millimeter, two millimeter high, cylinders of graphite on the surface of which he immobilized microparticles. And uh, then he was able in a really uh, very complex thermostat uh, system to measure the temperature changes upon electrochemical conversions. And you see it's in the milli Kelvin range here. And he uh, combined that with cyclic voltammetry. So you see on the left side, the currents, on the right, uh, right side, the delta T, uh, the temperature changes. And he was able to calculate the electrochemical Petty coefficients for, again, these copper hexacyanophorates. And he could determine the standard reaction entropies. He compared it with uh, uh, data from a thermostated cell and uh, the coincidence uh, was rather good. So that was a very, very nice work, I think, uh, combining uh, calorimetry with electrochemistry. So again, it brings me back to the question, how does that uh, proceeds on a microscopic scale? You have a phase one, let us say lead oxide, and here that is lead, but how, how does that reaction proceed? Uh, we could show that it can be a topotactic reaction. And we have shown that, or better to say the PhD student Uli Hasse has shown, when you apply a very short pulse uh, for the, with our AFM, of course, a very short pulse to such crystals, you see that here a reaction front goes very quickly through such microcrystal. It's uh, no surprise because uh, uh, the crystallographic system of PBO and PB are the same. So it can be really a topotactic reaction and you only have um, to consider an ingress of proton and then um, uh, going out of water molecules so that the lead can crystallize directly on the PBO. 
then we can go via the soft species. For example, when you oxidize silver to silver iodide. Again, Uli Hasse did that by um, <clears throat> AFM here. You see all the silver crystals and finally the uh, silver iodide crystals. You see uh, out of these, I, I think that there are 600 crystals also, only 20 uh, big crystals have formed and one could understand that only via uh, dissolved state, a uh, super saturation on the electrode surface. And of course we have uh, uh, um, uh, consolidated that idea with electrochemical measurements, but I, I can, ah, uh, here you see 2036 crystals uh, have formed 27. Uh, with other electrochemical methods, we could really directly show that this goes via oversaturated solution. And then it can go via an amorphous phase, what we already expected in case of the uh, one lead uh, hydroxychloride, but uh, this we could not study with the AFM because the crystals were too large. We used silver sulfide to silver. And you see when you apply reduction potential, then you go from here to there, to there, to there, to there, to there, here, here. You see in between is a hump of, uh, that's not a crystal, of, of a, a hump of, lead, uh, of silver atoms. And at the end, it recrystallizes to a very nice silver crystal. Here's the silver sulfide, here's the silver, Again, it is easy to understand because monoclinic silver sulfide forms cubic silver and so that needs a um, uh, transition state of amorphous silver. Now I want to tell you something about uh, applications of these techniques and uh, Antonio Domine Carbo uh, has developed electrochemical uh, electrochemical age determinations of metallic specimen. Age determinations are very important. You know the carbon, uh, radiocarbon method and so on. But for metals, there are only two and very exceptional uh, possibilities to date metals with a really clock and uh, clock that has a defined zero setting. So dendrology of woods and C14 methods and so on. all these methods can be applied, but not to metals. And uh, so uh, electrochemical dating uh, was shown by Dominic Antonio uh, for many or for a number of metals, lead, copper, bronze, gold, gildings, and so on. And even coinage mints, asphalts and archeological tasks. I give only one example. When uh, lead corrodes, corrodes, it forms first PBO and then PBO2. So when uh, you study old uh, specimen, you will see a signal of PBO and PBO2 when you remove the, uh, the corrosion products. And from the ratio of these uh, forms, uh, you can determine the age and what was most surprising for us is that you can apply that for gold because normally you will say gold is very inert, but of course it forms um, uh, oxidized uh, oxides, gold oxides on, on the surface. And uh, no one can apply a trick uh, after reduction, you get then active gold sites. And these active gold sites, depend on the age of the gold. And here you see such a calibration curve for of course known uh, coins and, and other uh, uh, samples, which stretch almost to 3000 years. And because gold is so inert, it is not surprising that it obviously does not much depend on the corrosion conditions. So it is not really depending on whether the gold was in uh, the soil or was kept in, uh, in a bag or wherever. And um, because under all conditions, it's a very slow process and obviously 
uh, not very much depending on the environmental conditions. It was very, very surprising for us, but um, I would suggest you should invite Antonio to Mexico and uh, he will explain that in best Spanish. And uh, he is also became famous for studying Maya blue and uh, the procedures to produce Maya blue and Maya yellow. Uh, with electrochemical methods, he followed the ways um, how the Mayas uh, possibly have uh, produced these materials that is all published in very good journals, Angewandte Chemie and also analytical chemistry and so on. Of course, I cannot speak here about that. Uh, for frescoes and for earth pigments, he developed uh, such develop, uh, such methods and, and could use it for, for such studies. He is working together with his sister. That's not a cup, but uh, they are uh, a brother and sister. And they have published a book about electrochemical methods in archaeometry together with uh, uh, Victoria Costa, Virginia, sorry, Virginia Costa. And he will produce a new uh, monograph soon. That is a, a, a website where you can uh, look up the uh, fingerprints of minerals and so on. And now let me uh, just use the last minutes to uh, um, compare the electro insertion electrochemistry uh, of particles with that of droplets. You, I told you about my dream to separate these two delta Gs. And one day I was together with a couple of lovers here, Sheboyka uh, and Milivoy in a restaurant in Greifswald. And uh, we had the idea, it should be possible to use a droplet of nitrobenzene, the salt ferrocene in it and start the electrochemistry. And when the delta G for the transfer of the anion uh, to the nitrobenzene is smaller than for the transferring the ferrocenium cations to the aqueous phase, then you have the electrochemistry of ion transfer and electron transfer. And of course, since long, we know the electrochemistry of the ferrocene in nitrobenzene. So that standard potential was known, or let us say the delta G for the electron transfer. And when we measure the entire system, uh, we should additionally get the delta G of ion transfer. That is the arrangement, it's not, uh, was not very simple. Our first experiment um, uh, failed because uh, uh, Sheboyka tried to immobilize nitrobenzene droplets on a glassy carbon electrode. And of course, when you apply a potential, then the droplet moves around and is not stable. So again, we had to uh, rely on the paraffin impregnated graphite electrodes where the droplets stay very stable. And then you could make that electrochemistry. And this was expanded mainly by Robin Gulabowski, a PhD student who you see here all the papers uh, where we studied different systems uh, different anions, and we could determine this ion transfer data uh, with a simple three electrode system, not with these complicated uh, uh, electrode uh, systems as used uh, in Prague and also by Giro and so on. And uh, share in this very important share has also um, Valentin Merczewski, both are from Macedonia. Okay, here you see data for all these data we have for the first time produced, of course, compared also with uh, literature data and so on. Here you see the transfer of peptide ions between water and nitrobenzene, even chiral ions between water and the chiral liquid phase. All that is possible and uh, produce very interesting data. So. The determination of Gibbs energies of ion transfer between miscible solvents. Uh, so the same like before with the hexacyanoferrates, you can also 
perform with the droplets. And uh, again, you uh, can easily determine the delta G uh, ion transfer from solution A to B, even when they are miscible. So solvent A, uh, it moved again. <laughs> solvent B, yesterday I moved it back to that place here. So I think solvent B is, B is here and this is solvent A. And um, then you can easily determine that. Okay, um, I'm coming to the end of my talk and I hope I could show you that thermodynamic studies really need to be cultivated. Um, uh, I have a, a very good relation to thermodynamics, not so good to kinetics. And so we cultivated this thermodynamic studies to provide new valuable information about electrochemical reactions. And uh, finally, I want to thank you for your attention and my special thanks to my former Mexican PhD students, Maxi, Max Maximiliano, uh, I already introduced to you, that's Gabriela Lopez de Lara Gonzalez and Victor Agmo Hernandez. He is now in Uppsala. We stay in very good contact and uh, I am grateful to you because you have invited me to the Mexican conference and uh, there I met these two students. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to hear your questions. Thank you, Fritz. Thank you for your uh, great conference. We have several questions in the chat and we have several questions. Uh, uh, the, the first one is uh, Ignacio Gonzalez. He wants to activate his uh, microphone to, to ask mm -hmm. you directly. Yeah. Please, Nacho. Very nice conference. Thank you very much. Because it's, a, it's, it's a great example that only with the measurements of the potential is possible to achieve, to know many fundamental things as the thermodynamics. Thank you very much. It's very, very nice conference. Thank, very, thank you, I, Nacho. I but thank I would you, like to say one thing. In the quantitative, quantitative way, it's very important to know how many particles are, are added to the carbon electrodes. How do you uh, manage this? Because in my, in my experience, it's very difficult to, to achieve the same quantity of the solid, uh, solid, uh, uh, solid uh, samples on the No, surface. you can't. You cannot, you, you cannot, but you know, we have developed uh, several approaches um, to get still quantitative information. I will give you one okay. example. When you have, for example, here, these hexacyanometallates, uh, and in these hexacyanometallates, you have two different metal ions, let us say iron and copper, both give a signal. And now mm -hmm. you study um, um, solid solutions with different composition. You will observe that at a certain composition, the copper signal vanishes and only the iron signal and, and so on. Uh, and you have to quantify now the signals. What we did, uh, we used a, a standard at the mixture of another compound, which is electroactive, and of course also showing insertion electrochemistry so that it is stable. So uh, we mixed first the same amounts of these hexacyanophorates with the same amount of that standard. So that is an um, order standard, you can say. Okay. And then you relate the copper signal and the iron signal always to the signal of the other powder uh, amount of, of substance. And then you have easy, easy calibration. This is not, not a big problem. And another example is uh, uh, where you have to find such, uh, yeah, this one, uh, where you have to find uh, a way to make calibration, yes. quantitative calibration. Yes. For example, these potentials of the solid solution, they depend slightly very really well, within 10 millivolts or so, they depend on the amount which you immobilize. And as you said, one cannot control that amount, but we did the following. We integrated these signals, you know? So the integral is of course a charge uh, of uh, the solid solution which uh, you have converted. And then we made plots 
of these potentials as a function of charge. And we get that for all these points, we get straight lines. And uh, one possibility would to use an arbitrary charge for the calibration, or you just extrapolate to zero okay. charge. And nice. then you get these points which have almost uh, or very, very small scattering. If you would not take that effect into account, the scattering would be a little bit larger. So um, this, um, there are several ways to, to make it quantitatively. Nice. Okay. And in much. chronoculometry, of course, uh, yes. it's natural. It's I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Sorry. We're going to move uh, the foot to the following question because uh, sh time yeah. is. is, is <laughs> okay, the next question is uh, from Guillermo Sosa. He, he asks you something that maybe you have already uh, discussed in your presentation, but he wants to know a little bit more about the characterization of uh, cor corrosion protections using this, this method. It could be possible to use this method to, to, to make- um, You things? know, I never did anything in corrosion of powders, but there were people in, in Czech Republic, no, in Slovakia. Uh, they studied uh, the corrosion of metal powders because that is also important, not only of compact pieces, but also of powders. Uh, of course, then it was very easy to uh, to to uh, study that. Uh, I think corrosion protect protection um, layers uh, you cannot study with on compact electrodes because uh, you would have to scratch it or whatever. You could study protection layers on particles. That of course, if you have, for example, zinc powder and you want to uh, um, make that zinc powder. Uh, protected against uh, uh, corrosion and dissolution, you can apply different layers and then you immobilize these and you can, uh, you should again make some calibration or with a standard, mix it with a standard and then measure always the zinc signal in relation to something else. Um, but uh, for corrosion layers on, on compact pieces is not suitable. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Jesus Rafael Gonzalez. He asks, asks you the following. Dear Dr. Schultz, in the case of dating by BIMP and EIS, uh, it's necessary the homogeneous corrosion of the material surface. I mean, in the case of copper corrosion, the formation of corrosion products such as oxide, uh, copper oxide or uh, uh, two or one, what happened when the corrosion atmosphere leads to the formation of uh, the, chlor the uh, chlorine copper? Yes, all, other... yes all, all that has uh, been dealt with. So I would like to refer uh, to these papers on copper and bronze. And uh, again, of course, it is, uh, the methodology is that you try to get a representative uh, sample of the corrosion layer, where you have, for example, the two oxides, or in case of copper, the copper carbonates and chlorides and carbonate chlorides, you know, there are uh, very different phases uh, that all has to be in, uh, taken into account. But by gently scratching the surface, you can really get a representative sample. I mean, that copper, uh, dating has been applied for by Antonio uh, for a helmet, a copper helmet, you know, a historic uh, old uh, copper helmet. And that was compared with the historic data. And so uh, all that is published and you can see that uh, you, uh, you can make the dating, but the dating uh, of course always uh, needs calibration. And mm -hmm. uh, the dating of lead and copper and bronze, of course, depends on the environmental conditions. So you cannot compare uh, or measure or date a sample from Peru uh, with a sample from, from Spain or from Russia or so, because the corrosion conditions were very different. But when you have a series of samples uh, which uh, have undergone the same corrosion, 
under the same environmental conditions, then it is possible. Only gold is really a fantastic um, a case where the conditions are much, much less, almost not important, you know. Antonio has uh, uh, applied that method to gold samples from South Africa and gold samples from Spain, and they all followed the same line and they were in agreement with the historical data. That is, of course, uh, the key question. If, if that would not be, then you have to prove that it's correct, but you are determining. Thank you. Regarding this point, I have, I have a, a personal question. It could be very interesting to use these different rates of corrosion of the different metals that are particular for each place for yes. creating something about like an electrochemistry origin certificate. And yeah, yeah, of course. Of, yes, that, that was uh, what Antonio did. I mean, uh, he applied that also uh, for differentiating between different uh, uh, sites where, where the samples have been found. Yes, you are yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting, that, that, yeah. that application. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, you have a final, well, we have a final comment about uh, Max, of course, <laughs> and your regards, and he congratulates Thank you for you. your you. and results and your research. And uh, he thanks that you have accepted this conference. He, they are uh, working now in the, in the, in the field of uh, this uh, uh, thermic determination by electrochemistry. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then he will expect to discuss his, uh, his, his results with you soon. Thank you very much. Best wishes to uh, Max. And I hope I can attend your lectures or the lectures where you are a co-author, but it's in the middle of the night, unfortunately. <laughs> we can communicate as our way. Well, with this, we've we finished this. Uh, ah, yeah, here we have an, another one. Uh, did you find some limitations to apply this, this technique in, in practice? Is there any limitation? Or, of or... course, I mean, <laughs> all, all, there is no universal method and uh, uh, there are limitations. And of course, uh, for the talk, you speak about the examples which work very well, but uh, what should I say? Something what didn't work, uh, I mean, that separation of, of the free energies, uh, as I told you, it works only when you have uh, reversible potentiometry and reversible voltammetry. And when it is very likely that the uh, binding of the ions on the surface and inside the solid are the same. If that is not fulfilled, it will not work. I have together with my uh, successor here in Greifswald, a Humboldt fellow now working on this uh, material and materials and T could show already that for the manganese oxide, such separation of the delta Gs is possible for nickel oxides also, but probably there are cases so irreversible <laughs> or not reversible enough for a reliable um, um, uh, electrochemical measurement. Thank you. Just a, maybe a, a short answer because we are already on the time. Uh, the, the, the final question is uh, the drop electrodes for ionic transfer between two liquids must yeah. be more complicated from the liquid liquid in electrochemistry. Could you comment a little bit about this? I didn't fully understood the question. What, what should be more complicated? The, 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 the may, drop? may I have the question, please? It's my ah, question. Yeah, natural. Yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yes, yeah. because for example, from the ionic transfer between two liquids, yeah. for example, shifting yeah. every everybody from the ionic ionic liquid transfer. Is, yeah, yeah. Is, uh, in my in my point of view, is is easier to understand because for the drop you have three interface: the solid, the, the, the electron conduct, conductor. The, the liquid, yeah, the, yeah. The yeah, yeah, how, yeah, yeah. How, how do you comment? Because no, for no. a long time, when, the, no, the no, look, when, no, yes. when all is reversible and uh, ferrocene, and uh, we use decamethyl ferrocene and other uh, compounds, uh, when the electrochemistry is reversible, 
the ion transfer occurs only about the liquid-liquid interface. Yes. And uh, in that case, the, uh, the circumference of the droplets and the attachment to the graphite plays zero role, absolutely no role, no effect. And um, I mean, uh, I, I can send you the papers uh, if you like, uh, where you can see how the reaction develops. Uh, of course, it starts at the interface because a nitrobenzene phase is always free of initially added ions. That is very important. When you have ions in the nitrobenzene phase, then you get partition and then yes. it's a mess. That, okay. that is impossible to study or almost is very difficult. But when the nitrobenzene is free of ions, uh, then only the ions entering from the aqueous phase play a role. And uh, that is the beauty of thermodynamics. When it's reversible, you get reliable data. <laughs> you know, to like get reliable data in kinetics is yes. <laughs> more complicated. Okay, we, we need to move a little bit uh, for the next part of our uh, sure. event. Thank you very much. Thank we, you very we really much. really appreciate Thank your you. participation in this uh, conference. And uh, we will send you your, your, your certificate of participation <laughs> uh, uh, by, by email. I'm just okay. uh, showing Thank it. You. Uh, could you please stop sharing your screen, please? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one moment. Uh, I don't know how to do it. Ah, stop. Okay, <laughs> now it's <Okay>. time. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is the certificate of for participation. We will send. We will send you it, it by email. And okay. uh, thank you very much for this. Thank uh, you. Great, great thank conference you. In our in, in our conference. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.